Good evening. Welcome this evening to our Wednesday night Bible study. It is indeed a pleasure. It's a privilege to come into your home, your workplace, your automobile, wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to come this evening, giving another word from the Lord. You know, that's what people need today. People need a word from the Lord. The Bible says man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. Now, the last few weeks we have been studying on a topic that I think is a topic that is just right for the season. We are dealing with race and politics. Listen, everybody else is talking about it. You got uh, black folks talking about it. You got white folks talking about it. You got Mexican folks, Chinese people. You got everybody talking about it. Well, we in the church, we might as well talk about it too because we can talk about it from a biblical perspective. Now, I want to encourage you to avail yourself. Go back. If you missed any of these lessons, uh, I believe this is number five here tonight. But if you miss any of these lessons, go back out there on the, um, Facebook and YouTube. It's out there. Uh, key it in if you miss any of these lessons because this is a series that we are bringing to you on uh, race and uh, social justice. And all of these lessons are building. One lesson is building upon the next lesson. This lesson is building. So if you miss any of the lesson, it's like you got some bricks missing in your building. You want to go on and uh, avail yourself to those lessons that's out there on uh, YouTube or Facebook. And let me just encourage you. You know, we have a daily radio ministry, not just a look in the book ministry. That's, that's the ministry with all of my sermons, the deeper look in the book ministry. But we talk a lot about a lot of the issues that are concerning it of our day. Uh, Ghostbusters, uh, is a program that is concerned with exposing the work of darkness because God uh, tells us over in Ephesians not to be partakers uh, with them, but rather reprove them and expose them. And so it is our job to expose the darkness, uh, the evil that's out there. But then also we are bringing in the light with that situation room. So. Uh, avail yourself to our uh, 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 radio ministry, klitb.com, klitb.com. And we'll start with In Your Corner, which is uh, a broadcast that deals with devotion all the way to uh, uh, stories of great Christians where you can look at how God has used great missionaries of the past. All right. Well, let's go ahead and begin our lesson with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that you have given to us this evening. Now, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength, you are our redeemer, and besides you there is no other. So speak, Lord, that your people can hear. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, this is lesson five, lesson five. Race and politics. Race and politics. Race and politics. Now, the aim of this lesson is to study the political history of black Americans from the mid-1800s to 1965. And so we'll look at uh, pre uh, Civil War all the way to 1965. And we need to study that because uh, um, most of my audience is black Americans. And so you need to understand your history. 
But those of you who are not black American, because we have a lot of people who are white Americans, we have some people from overseas that are watching us, this will help you understand uh, our history as well. Because a lot of people, like I say, it's out there. You got a lot of stuff that uh, is being told and we need to know our history. Now, why study politics? Why study politics? You know, we are studying here at Bible Way politics and religion. Now, why do we study politics? Because politics deal with how we live right now. How we live right now, uh, that's politics. Now, religion deals with how and where we're going to live for all of eternity. So you need to study both. You need to study politics, how we live right now. And you need to study religion, uh, how we can live not only right now, but for all of eternity and where we're going to live. Now, why study history? Why study history? so that we can know where we have come from in order to know where, which way we ought to go. And so we can know where we've come from in order to know which way we are to go. I remember when I used to get ready to go out of town, I used to get on the computer and I would get, look up uh, MapQuest. And MapQuest, the first thing that it would ask for, it's not your destination, where you're going. It, it, it would want to know uh, where you're coming from, but for, where are you going to start? And then uh, once you determine your starting point, then you fill in where you want to go. And so uh, uh, in order to know uh, how to get to where you're going, you have to first of all understand where you're at and where you're coming from. Because see, if I'm trying to go to Chicago from New York City, uh, then I'm going to have to go west. But if I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, then, and I'm trying to get to Chicago, then I'm going to have to go east. Uh, if I'm in Mississippi and I'm trying to get to Chicago, then I'm going to go north. So uh, if you want to know uh, how to get to where you're trying to go, you got to first find out where you're coming from. And so that's what we need to do. And then also, we need to have a greater appreciation uh, for God. And see, you can have a greater appreciation for God once you find out where God has brought you from. When you find out where God has brought you from, then you'll have a greater appreciation for God. Now, the book that got the Civil War started. What was the book that got the Civil War started? Because that was a book that was written before the Civil War, and everybody, it got, it got, you know, in the country, we would say it got people dandruffs up. It got they dandruffs up. Oh, yeah. What was the book? The book was Uncle Tom Cabin by Harriet Beatrice Stowe. She wrote that book in 1852. Harriet Beatrice Stowe. When Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in 1852, the anti-slavery novel flew off the shelves. 17 printing presses ran 24 hours a day to keep up with the demand, making it the best-selling novel of the 19th century. The book struck at our emotions as a nation, and it made us see ourselves. It was our emotional mirror, and it prompted some individuals to rethink how they thought of slavery. Uncle Tom's Cabin has been cited as a factor leading to the Civil War. When Abraham Lincoln later met the author, Harriet Beecher Stowe, he reportedly said, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. In 1852, the backlash was immediate and powerful. In the South, the book was banned. And if you were caught selling the book, 
you were either going to be killed or thrown in prison. There was tremendous fear that this book would make a difference. It did by portraying Uncle Tom as a dignified, intelligent, God-fearing man. In the South, however, traveling Tom shows became popular, depicting him as a submissive buffoon, happy in his enslaved condition, a stereotype that still exists today. All right, so you can see the book that started slavery, uh, not started slavery, the Civil War, was this book, Uncle Tom Cabin. And it was about this black man that got mistreated in slavery. And it followed this black man around and it showed the horror of slavery. And he was a, the, the true Uncle Tom was a man who was a dignified man, an honest man, a Christian a slave, and he would not sell out. He would not tell the slave master uh, about the other slaves that had left during the night. He, uh, they beat him mercilessly. Uh, they beat him just about to death. And when people found out about the horror of slavery, then through this Uncle Tom, uh, that book brought about the Civil War. But then they later on changed the character of Uncle Tom to being this lit submissive man who was happy to be a slave. And he sold out all the slaves. So they, they changed things around, but the original was not that way. The Republican Party was founded to stamp out slavery in May 1854. Now, if somebody would have asked you that question, what political party was organized to stamp out slavery, you probably would not have said the Republican Party, but the Republican Party was founded in May of 1854 to be an anti-slavery laws in Congress. In May of 1854, a number of the anti-slavery Democrats in Congress formed a new political party to fight slavery and secure equal rights for black Americans. The name of that party? They called it the Republican Party. They called it that because they wanted to return to the principles of freedom and equality first set forth in the governing documents of the Republic before the pro-slavery members of Congress had perverted those original principles. One of the founders of that new party was U.S. Senator Charles Sumner, who had taken the seat of the great anti-slavery senator, Daniel Webster. Sumner had a record of promoting civil rights. In fact, he had championed the desegregation of public schools in Boston. Here is his argument before the state Supreme Court on that issue. In 1856, Sumner gave a two-day long speech in the U.S. Senate against slavery. Following that speech, Democratic Representative Preston Brooks from South Carolina came from the House across the rotunda of the Capitol and over to the Senate where he literally clubbed down Sumner on the floor of the Senate, knocked him unconscious and beat him almost to death. According to the sources of that day, many Democrats thought that Sumner's clubbing was deserved and it even amused them. It was three and a half years before Sumner recovered himself sufficiently to return to the Senate. And not surprisingly, the first speech he delivered on his return to the Senate was again against slavery. All right, so they couldn't beat the truth out of this man. That man, Charles Sumner, he kept on teaching and standing up for slaves. And uh, it was the Republican Party. So in other words, it was some uh, uh, Democrats that uh, wanted to stand up for the slaves. And so they split off. They split off and they left the Democratic Party and they started this new party, the Republican Party, 1854. As a result, we see the 13th Amendment came about. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The Civil War, but even before the war had come to an end, a vote had been held in Congress on the constitutional amendment to abolish slavery, the 13th Amendment. Congress passed that amendment and this poster 
was quickly issued to honor the 137 members of Congress who had voted to abolish slavery. At the time of that vote, there were 118 Republicans in Congress and 82 Northern Democrats. Of the 118 Republicans, all 118 voted to abolish slavery. However, of the 82 Democrats, only 19 voted to end slavery. Only 23% of Democrats, and these were the Northern Democrats. When the vote had been taken in Congress on the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery, the chambers had been packed from wall to wall with expectant observers. When the numbers were counted, and it was announced that the amendment had passed, a roar erupted from the thousands in the chamber. Hats were thrown and voices were raised in exuberant cheers. Congress had voted to end slavery. How should something that profound be celebrated? Members of the House asked that a sermon be preached to commemorate the event. And whom did they ask to preach the sermon? The Reverend Henry Highland Garnett. Garnett became the first African American to speak in the halls of Congress, and he preached this sermon on Sunday, February the 12th, 1865, and it was powerful. He began that sermon with a recollection of his own personal experiences. What is... All right, so now if you want to hear that sermon, then you'll have to go and look up... Uh, uh, out on YouTube, American History in Black and White. And uh, uh, it's a 12 part series, but look up under, uh, I believe it's uh, lecture number three. But he gave a powerful, powerful preach. Now, we have been talked today, separation of church and state, yes, but there's not a separation of state and God. People today, they don't want you to bring God. But they used to have preaching. They used to have preaching back in Congress. There, for Nancy Pelosi is at the day, they would have preaching there. Yeah. That's how they celebrate stuff. They celebrated it with a worship service. Uh, they celebrated the 14th Amendment, which made former slaves uh, to the right to full citizenship. So the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment gave them full uh, citizenship. And even the 15th Amendment, I'll throw that in. The 15th Amendment gave former slaves the right to vote. And so uh, in uh, 1870, uh, uh, slaves had even the right to vote, former slaves. Then you had Reconstruction from 1866 to 1876. Uh, they began, this was after the Civil War. You begin to see uh, blacks begin to uh, build colleges. Most of your historical black colleges was made, was built during the Reconstruction period. But then you see the rise of the Republican Party in the South, but you also see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, the White League, and the Red Shirts. Because of the 13th Amendment and the end of slavery, black Americans, particularly in the South, could now enjoy their first real taste of civil rights, their first genuine opportunity for political participation. Within a year, blacks were registering to vote and were forming political parties across the South. For example, at a rally in Houston, Texas, on July the 4th, 1867, 150 blacks and 20 whites formed the Republican Party of Texas. And black Americans also started other Southern Republican parties as well. In fact, the first 42 blacks elected to the state legislature in Texas were all Republicans. And in Louisiana, the first 95 black representatives and the first 32 black senators were, again, all Republicans. Similarly, in Alabama, the first 103 blacks elected to the state legislature were all Republicans. In Mississippi, the first 112 black legislators were Republicans. In South Carolina, the first 190. In Virginia, the first 46. In Florida, the first 30. And the same in North Carolina. And in Georgia, 41 blacks were elected to the state legislature, all as Republicans. So great were the gains of blacks through the Republican Party that Democrats began to fight back in other ways. 
Recall that black Americans had made huge gains in Louisiana with the election of 127 black legislators and even a black lieutenant governor, PBS Pinchback, who later became state governor. To halt such progress, in 1866, Democrats, in conjunction with the city police and the Democratic mayor of New Orleans, attacked the Republican convention in that city, killing 40 blacks, 20 whites, and wounding 150 others. Democrats even rushed the floor of the Louisiana legislature to seize by force the power away from the elected black Republicans. The federal troops arrived to restore peace and return African Americans to their lawfully elected positions. Similarly, violent and often deadly attacks by Democrats against Republicans also occurred in other states as well. While much early Democratic opposition occurred on a state-by-state -state or a local basis, in 1866, Democrats formed a group that became national. Its declared purpose was to break down the Republican government and to pave the way for Democrats to regain control in the elections. What was the name of that group? The Ku Klux Klan. Although it is relatively unreported today, the historical documents are unequivocal that the Klan was started by Democrats and that the Klan played a prominent role in the Democratic Party. This 13-volume set of congressional investigations from 1872 conclusively and irrefutably documents that fact. The Klan terrorized black Americans through murders and public floggings. Relief was granted only if they promised not to vote for Republican tickets, and violation of this oath was punishable by death. And since the All right. So you see, blacks was making a lot of progress for the first 15, 20 years after the Civil War. But then uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, got together uh, with the Democratic Party uh, to put an end to Reconstruction. You had the Colfort Massacre and the rise of the White League and the Red Shirts. These were some groups, but they didn't wear no hood. Uh, like the Ku Klux Klan. 14th and 15th Klan. Amendment, the military occupation of the South. This is the period of history from basically 1867 to 1877, about a decade, called Reconstruction. And during Reconstruction, the black codes were eliminated. And for the most part, African Americans were allowed to vote. And you did have African Americans that were elected to high office. You had governors. Uh, there was a African American senator. There were African American state legislators. So it was kind of working, but of of course, it's all being held together by military occupation. And then there was an incident in Louisiana in 1873 called the Colfax Massacre. And this is really kind of the uh, Southern Democratic forces trying to uh, coalesce around groups in order to take back what they see as their rightful place as leaders of these Southern governments. And in Louisiana, at the Colfax Massacre in 1873, there was a group called the White League. And this White League, unlike the Klan, which was kind of a terrorist under the ground organization, the White Leagues and the Red Shirts, um, groups throughout the South, were open about their, you know, opposition to African American rights and their wanting of power. So at Colfax, this White League basically attacked a courthouse that was being held by Republican forces. And we basically have a mini civil war at Colfax. We ended up having about 150 African Americans that were murdered, maybe more, we're not really sure about mass graves and people that were thrown into the river and such. But that culminated in a federal trial with the conviction of some of those people who did that based on the 1870 Enforcement Act saying that you know, Congress is going to have the ability to prosecute people that are violating the rights of freedmen. In 1876, the Supreme Court comes out with a decision called United States v. Khrushchev, where they basically kind of take the teeth out of the Enforcement Act by saying that because this White League was not a government group but a private organization, the Enforcement Act didn't hold. That private groups could discriminate. You had to get them a different way. You probably had to use state and local courts, which weren't going to work back then. So that's kind of a breakdown of federal control over you know, the, the Southern governments and the, the rise of what's going to become Jim Crow. And then really, it all falls apart in the election of 1876. You could all right, and so you have reconstruction going on all the way up to 1876, 1877.
And then when you had the election, the Democrats began to start seizing power in the 1876 election when they took office in 1877. So uh, Johnson pulled out the troops, the troops was pulled out of the South at uh, that point. And then uh, you saw a lot of uh, these terrorist groups that came into being. There was something about the gun control Here's a little history for you. Gun control in America is rooted in racism. That's right. The modern gun control movement is just today's version of the exact policies used to keep firearms out of the hands of freed slaves after the Civil War. Like we showed you last episode, gun control doesn't harm the powerful, connected, protected people who push for it. It's always been about controlling a segment of the population. And what better way to maintain dominance over an ethnic group than to ensure they're disarmed? Don't believe me? Keep watching. Gun control has absolutely nothing to do ideologically with the control of firearms. If you do even a most cursory uh, look at history between guns and gun ownership, you will find that without question, gun laws were created to restrict gun ownership from certain classes of people. Long before the revolution, long before the drafting of the Second Amendment, laws were passed uh, in the uh, various colonies uh, in what is now the United States to take away guns from minorities. The first gun control laws in America start in 1620 in Virginia when the legislature enacts a law saying don't let black people have guns. And that's been sort of the key theme of American gun control for, for centuries ever after. And so basically whenever you hear the word gun control, don't so much think gun control, think about minority control. It's just a way to control minorities or blacks or a certain part of the population. And then you have the National Rifle Association was formed to protect slaves after the Civil War. 10, 11, 12 years old. We got the NRA. The NRA was originally started by Grantham when to comes to Sherman to help protect and get empowered blacks in the South because they was being lynched, they was being told they couldn't own arms, they were setting laws and regulations, and they would go to courts for them in that time period. Right. But yet, they don't teach that to these kids. You, the media don't care about that, as long as it goes with an agenda that is mainstream for the moment. So why come they don't teach that, ladies and gentlemen? How many of you out there know that the NRA, one of their purposes, it, it wasn't the whole purpose, but one of their purposes in founding that organization, they said, we need to help these former slaves unless they're going to end up back in slavery. And so the NRA was a group that God worked through to help us. And so you had the end of the Reconstruction, you have the rise of the Jim Crow laws, separate but equal. The Democrats imposed laws to keep uh, blacks from voting. Democrats understood how important it was to their survival to prevent blacks from voting. In fact, this illustration from that period shows an allegory of the Bible story of Samson who lost his strength when his hair was cut. In the picture, you see that the woman has used her razor, called the lost cause regained, to cut the black Samson's hair and cause him to lose his strength. And what is his hair? His strength? It is called suffrage or voting. With the strength or the vote of black Americans removed, you see the various democratic groups and leaders rejoicing in the background, including Confederates, the KKK, pro-slavery forces, and various famous democratic leaders of that day, including General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who headed the Ku Klux Klan. By the way, notice the phrase, 
the Democratic barbecue and that Democrats are burning various books in the foreground, including the Holy Bible. Wow. Isn't that something? So they use that uh, picture of Samson and Delilah and how Samson had cut off the hair of uh, uh, Delilah had cut off the hair of Samson, cut off his scrint, and they show that when the black man, if we can uh, cut him off from voting, then we're going to take away his, his scrint. And then they had a barbecue, and one of the things that they burned up was the Bible. The Democrats also uh, implemented some other things to keep blacks from voting. It was poll tax. You had to pay a tax in order to vote. Literally, tests. Uh, they would ask different questions uh, and test your literacy. A lot of times, they would ask foolish stuff, like how many bubbles is in a bar of soap? And, and if you couldn't tell them, then uh, you couldn't vote. Uh, grandfather clause. Did your granddaddy vote? Well, if your granddaddy didn't vote, then you can't vote. And suppressive procedure, they would come up with all kind of procedures. Hide and seek poll in places. Now, they use a lot of this stuff today. Uh, where you voted uh, four years ago, uh, and you go there, they don't put the uh, poll somewhere else. They just won't leave it at a certain school. They keep moving it around because they know that... <laughs> People get frustrated and they say, well, I was going to vote, but I couldn't find the place where we was going to vote. Black codes, uh, gerrymandering where they uh, redraw the district up, a district that was Republican, they could make it Democrat, or a district that was Democrat, they could make it Republican. And then they uh, come up with white only. And then violence. All of these were the different methods that the Democrats used to keep us from voting right after uh, uh, Reconstruction. Uh, you know, segregation. And we're going to put the blame squarely on maybe one of the most racist presidents, a Democrat by the name of Woodrow Wilson. Even though Woodrow Wilson was the head of Princeton in New Jersey, and people tend to think of him as a, as a progressive, he may have been a progressive in some respects, but he was born down in Virginia you know, before the Civil War. So he's the first Southerner to be elected to the presidency of the United States since the Civil War. And one of his first things that he's going to do, he's going to segregate the federal workplace. He's going to segregate the army. In fact, if you were applying for a position in the Wilson administration, you had to send a photo just to make sure you were of the right, you know, skin color. So Wilson and the Democrats are just as guilty as the Democrats in the South on a state and local level of, of kind of making all right, all right. And uh, there was a lot of fear and stuff. And one of the things that uh, was used was this movie, The Birth of a Nation. The first movie that was ever shown at the White House in 1915 was The Birth of a Nation. And we're just going to give you a little clip of it right here. And so the ride in the Masters Hall, the Negro Party is in control of the State House of Representatives, 101 blacks, and you've got 23 whites. And this is down in South Carolina, and they are showing this, a historical incident from the first legislative session on the Reconstruction. You see the blacks in control, but look how they showing the blacks. They acting up down there at the place. The man is drinking. Man pulling off his shoes. Got his shoes. All the fellas they eating. Yeah, he's eating that drumstick. The, the Speaker of the House ruled that all members must wear shoes. Yeah. 
So he got to put his shoes back on. It is moving carry that all white must salute Negroes, officers on the street. And down at the at bottom, it shows that this film was screened in the White House of President Wilson on February 18, 1915. The helpless white minority, look at the 23 white people, they can't do nothing. Black people is running things. White visitors in the gallery. Look at those couple of white ladies up there in the gallery. Look at the black men looking at that white lady. The patches of a bill providing for inner marriages of blacks and whites. Blacks and whites, they just passed the bill. Now look at all them looking at them white folks. White people say we gotta get out of Dodge. Look at them blacks, they're so happy that black people can marry white people. Now, the strange thing about that movie, ladies and gentlemen, they didn't have one black actor. All of those actors in the movie was white people in black face. And for the next 20 some years, Hollywood would use that movie as a training tool. Now, why they couldn't use something else? But they used that movie there, and as a result, you're going to see what happened. The Ku Klux Klan, when people saw that movie, the Ku Klux Klan grew to about 2 million members because later on in the movie, it's going to show how a, a black man was trying to rape a white lady, and this lady jumped off a cliff. And so as a result, it shows how the Ku Klux Klan came to the rescue to save white people. And, they, and, and it grew to an all-time high. The, the Democrats began to work hard in the area of black genocide. Margaret Sanger organized Planned Parenthood. Marketing research had shown them that in this environment, they needed to move away from words like control in favor of less threatening words like planning. So in 1942, they changed the name of the organization. From then on, the American Birth Control League would officially be known as Planned Parenthood. The important thing to understand here is that this name change did not change the organization's agenda. The same people were still in control, they were still obsessed with race, and they were still dedicated to eugenics. Today, defenders of Margaret Sanger will often try to hide her racism by claiming that she was not really a eugenicist and that Planned Parenthood was never part of the eugenics movement. But the truth is that as late as 1956, the American Eugenics Society listed Sanger as a member of the organization. In addition, many of Sanger's colleagues and the people whose writings she published, as well as many of Planned Parenthood's officers, were also known to be members. In fact, the ties between Sanger and the eugenics movement were so well established that in the 1920s, Sanger pursued a plan to merge the American Birth Control League, or Planned Parenthood, as it was later called, with the American Eugenics Society. However, despite Sanger's efforts, the merger plan died after being rejected by the leadership of the American Eugenics Society. As an alternative, Sanger then proposed that the two organizations at least combine their publications into one magazine. But again, that idea was also rejected by the American Eugenics Society. The eugenic and civilization value of birth control is becoming apparent to the enlightened and the intelligent. The campaign for birth control is not merely of eugenic value, but is practically identical in ideal with the final aim of eugenics. Margaret Sanger, 1921. In her autobiography, Margaret Sanger wrote about a speech she gave in 1926 at a Ku Klux Klan rally in Silver Lake, New Jersey. The Planned Parenthood founder bragged about the fact that afterward, she was invited by 12 other Klan chapters to speak at their events. All right, so the lady that started Planned Parenthood, she had in her mind to wipe out black people, to control the black population. 
and she was working with the Ku Klux Klan. Then you have President Roosevelt with the New Deal. Blacks began to, for the first time, started switching from the Republican to going to the Democratic Party. Then President Harry Truman. Now keep in mind, uh, with this New Deal, uh, that was a lot of first kind of like welfare programs, uh, and he stayed in office for 16 years. Uh, then President Harry Truman, he proposed a civil right package uh, against anti-lynching, ban, poll tax, desegregating of the military, but the Democratic Congress killed all of these proposals. Now think about it, you got a Democratic president, but the Democratic Congress, because the Democrats is now in power, because remember they came up with the Ku Klux Klan, and so for the next hundred years, from like 1876 uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to 1965, uh, a lot of black people stopped voting because they were too scared to vote because of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, then you have Dwight Eisenhower, which was a Republican. He went back to trying to help black people. Uh, so in 1954, you had the famous case, Brown versus the Board of Education, where it calls for integration of public school. Inferior and dilapidated schools for blacks became the norm in the southern states under Democratic control. In 1954, the Supreme Court and Brown versus Board of Education finally struck down state segregation laws in education thus reinstating what Republicans had done nearly 75 years earlier in the 1875 Civil Rights Bill. What was the Southern Democratic response? All right. And so you had Eisenhower begin to integrate the school. But the Democratic response went beyond words and also included actions. For example, in 1956, Democratic Governor Alan Shivers of Texas deployed the Texas Rangers to keep blacks from entering schools in Mansfield. The following year, 1957, Democratic Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas called out the National Guard to keep black students from entering Central High School in Little Rock. However, Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower quickly intervened and he federalized the Arkansas National Guard to take it away from Governor Faubus. Eisenhower then replaced the Arkansas Guard with 1,200 troops from the elite 101st Airborne Division, ordering them to protect the nine black students who had chosen to go to Central High. Democrats in the U.S. Senate strongly protested against Eisenhower's actions to protect these black students. Georgia Democratic Governor Marvin Griffin also attacked Eisenhower's actions and promised that as long as he held office, he would, quote, maintain segregation in the schools and the races will not be mixed come hell or high water, end quote. Meanwhile, in Arkansas, Democratic Governor Faubus, unable to prevent black students from attending school because of the federal protection they'd received, simply shut down the schools for the next year to prevent further attendance. And Virginia Democratic Governor James Allman, like other Southern Democratic governors, also shut down public schools rather than permit black students to attend. In 1960 in Louisiana, where Democratic Governor Jimmy Davis supported segregation, it required four federal marshals to accompany little Ruby Bridges so she could attend a public elementary school in New Orleans. So deep-seated was the racism among Southern Democratic leaders that when the 1964 Civil Rights Bill became law, Lester Maddox, who became Democratic Governor of Georgia, sold the fast food business that he owned rather than serve blacks in his restaurant. And in so the South in the 50s and 60s, all those governors down there was Democrat and they was against integration. Dwight Eisenhower had something called Operation Wetback to try to protect minorities from uh, uh, immigration, uh, the immigrants coming and taking their jobs. On June 17th, 
1954, 2,000 undocumented Mexican workers were deported across the United States-Mexican border at the beginning of the most aggressive Mexican deportation program up until that time. Official records state that over the course of the next several months, approximately 1.3 million Mexicans either voluntarily left the United States or were forcibly deported. These mass deportations made up the 1954 campaign known as Operation Wetback. This is its story. At that time, the Republican Party, do you see, they were still fighting for the rights of blacks, trying to protect uh, poor people's jobs and black people's jobs and things like that by keeping uh, a lot of the immigrants out. But then you had President Johnson, who was a Democrat, and he was able to get some things done, uh, passing a Civil Rights Act of 1964, then he passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So a lot of the stuff that was voted down 10 years earlier because the people were still thinking about what had happened to uh, President uh, Kennedy, had just gotten shot in 63, and then the March on Washington in 1963. People said something needs to be done, and we got the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and 1965. On both of these acts, it was the Republican Party that pushed for both of these rights. 80% of the Republicans voted for these bills, while only 70% of the Democrats voted for these bills. You had over 300 and some Democrats, and they could have easily voted for both of these bills without the help of the Republican Party. They didn't even need the help. They had so many Democrats. But uh, the Republican Party was the one that really pushed it. Matter of fact, the Democrats tried to... Uh, have a filibuster, but Johnson worked with the Republicans and got enough Republican people to help him to get that bill passed. President Johnson once said, if these, and he used the N-word, are gonna vote, they might as well vote for us Democrat. I'll have them, and he used the N-word, voting for us for the next 200 years. So keep in mind, the Democrats was the party that was pro-slavery. They was for slavery. They was to keep the black man down. And he said, since they're going to be voting, they might as well vote for us for the next 200 years. And as a result was to start a black Democrat plantation. And so from 1965 on, most black people have started voting Democrat. Now, what can we learn from our lesson today? How should we apply this lesson? Number one, know your history. Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. The Bible also says, and there rose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor the yet the work which he had done for Israel. And so, and this is what is happening today. A lot of our young people today, they don't know this history. And because they don't know the history, they don't know what God has done for us. It has been said that those who fail to know their history are doomed to repeat it. See, if you don't know who was evil, you could be in bed with evil, but you don't know the evil because you don't know the history. Second lesson, don't be deceived by politicians. Don't be deceived. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The Bible says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteous 
is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinned from the beginning. The Bible also says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are raving wool. He says you shall know them by their fruit. This is what Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 through 16. So be careful these politicians uh, they are looking one way on the outside, but on the inside, a lot of them hadn't changed. They're a wolf in disguise. Third thing, remember that politicians are our servants and not our master. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, nay, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battle. They wanted somebody to serve them. They wanted somebody to judge them, uh, or go before them, fight the battle. They was looking for somebody to serve them. But Samuel had told them, no, uh, you're going to end up working for him. Matter of fact, your children, your son, your daughter, He's going to take your land. He's going to raise the taxes and everything. In other words, he's going to be your master. Y'all going to be his servant. And that's how, that's what's wrong today. A lot of the politicians, they act like they are masters rather than our servants. Uh, for even the son of man came not to minister unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to be served. But he says, I came to serve. And said, a real politician, he comes to serve. He comes to serve. Number four, last thing. Don't trust man with your future, but God only. Trust God only. The Bible says, somebody once said, in politics we have permanent concerns, but we don't have permanent friends. So in other words, you can change. You, can, you, don't, you don't have to just stay committed to this man. Even though you voted for him, you don't have to vote for him next time. You don't have to stay committed to this party. You can change parties. You can change sides so that uh, we can, they can be working for us. They can be our servants and not we are the, not them being our masters. The Bible says, Cursed is a man that put his trust in man. And I, I left that off. Uh, that was over in uh, Jeremiah where it says, Curse is man, put his trust in man. But the Bible also says, Now when John had heard in prison the work of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? For John was in prison, and Jesus didn't come and see about him. He started down. Now, is Jesus really... The Christ, is he really who he said he was? And then Jesus began to just put on a healing service, began to heal the sick, began to clean the lepers, began to cast out demons. He said, now go tell John what you done seen uh, and what you done heard. And then John began to put his faith back in Jesus. He said, yes, he's the one. He's the Christ. And so, but if people start showing you in their actions these politicians is showing you that they are not really for you, then you need to change sides. He says, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man but Jesus only. You remember that story over in Matthew 17. Uh, Jesus went to the mountaintop, took Peter, James, and John with him, and on that mountaintop, he had Elijah, he had Moses, and that was Jesus. And Peter said, let's build a tabernacle, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. But then that cloud covered them, and they saw no man but Jesus only. So even though Moses was a good politician in his day, and Elijah was a good prophet in his day, no, no, neither one can come up to Jesus. Don't put nobody on the level of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, only Jesus Christ can get us out of the mess that we are in. So what's the conclusion? A 
look like my tape done messed up here. But let me just give you the conclusion. Oh, I done went back. Let me give you the conclusion. We must pray and ask God for wisdom and understanding in order to choose God's man so that we can be like the sons of Issachar who were men who had the understanding of the time that they know what to do. And so, and that's 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. You can read it. All right, that's our lesson for tonight. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Take this word and use it to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.